blessed is the man with a vision. Hallelujah. Father, we are grateful for your love. I'm so thankful. <laughs> Lord, we can't use it up. We can't. Lord, we just can't even comprehend how deep and how wide, how high that you have lavished your love and your grace upon us. We didn't deserve it. We can't earn it. You have given it to us. I'm so grateful for that. Lord, I pray as we open your word, you would let life come forth. You would meet us where we are and take us in the next step of where you want us to be. You would renew our minds. Challenge us today, Father. Thank you, Lord. One time or another, we've probably all struggled with wondering whether our life has any value, if it really matters. I, I hope that after our little bit of time we spent together last week, some of that's been laid to a peaceful rest. <laughs> we all have value. We all have worth. We all have a life worth living. We all make a difference because of who it is that is in us. And the first scripture I used last week was one I want to spend some time thinking some more on this week. And it is, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And when I read a verse like that, I think of Paul's charge to us that he says, I want you to live a life that's worthy of the calling. And my mind naturally goes to, well, how and what and what am I supposed to do and how do I know and how do I evaluate those type things? And I gave us a few examples last week that were sort of scratching the surface there about learning how to give thanks and seeking first the kingdom of God and submitting to God and learning to get our mind renewed to recognize the lies that are thrown at us constantly and what is truth and what is error. Allowing time for the fruit of the Spirit to grow in our life and everybody else's life and learning how to walk in love one to another. And, and those things are all important and they are foundational. But I want to go a little bit deeper this week. I want to, I want to dig a little bit deeper. We, we also understand that the word walk implies a process, implies a direction, implies a life. When we run into that in the scripture, you know, blessed is the man who walks in a certain direction, we understand that means we're, we're going somewhere, we're heading somewhere. And so Paul is talking, us, talking to us about our daily walk, how we walk with God. And I want you to live in a way, walk in a way that is worthy. And so if we're breathing in here today, which most of us are, then we have a walk and we have a life that is worth living. Now, how do we do it? Well, Paul goes on to explain, and he gives us five different Goals, I would say, are, is a good word for it. In the next couple of verses, uh, uh, five principles, five whatever clarifies or clarifiers, I would say goals. And he, and he says, with all humility and gentleness, live a life worthy of the Lord to the calling you have. With all humility, with gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. To begin to learn to live a life that is worthy of the Lord, we need to understand that we have to be properly aligned with our Father and with our God. And the way that is clearly displayed, and I don't necessarily like this, but it is true. The way it is displayed that we are properly aligned is directly connected to how we live with people, <laughs> how we get along with people. John said it this way, we know, we know that we have passed out of death into life. Why? Because we love the brothers. <laughs> Whoever doesn't love is still in death. God help me sometimes. <laughs> or later he says, if anyone says I love God and hates his brother, what is he? He's a liar. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. That's got to be our goal, isn't it? We want to live a life worthy of the calling to which we have received is directly tied together with how we live with those who are around us and near us. That's tough sometimes. Paul lays out how we're supposed to do this. Live a life worthy of the calling with all humility. Isn't that great? Some translations say be completely humble. This is a tough one. But yet if we don't get this one right, 
the foundation is never going to stand. I mean, the, the building isn't going to be built on a foundation that will last. The only way to end up at unity, end up in a right relationship with God, is to begin with humility, to understand what that means. And he doesn't just say, oh, be humble, guys. He says, with all humility, completely humble. And all is a big word there. Complete is a big word. It means, it has shades of meaning like all possible ways to be humble. <laughs> Every kind of humility. And I don't know if I can get past this one with my daily life. Humility in the scripture is defined, and in, in, you can look up the Greek word later if you want, Low, lowliness, humility. It's an inside-out virtue produced by comparing ourselves to the Lord rather than to others. This brings behavior into alignment with this inner revelation to keep one from being self-exalting. Wow. I look at the Lord and see how I'm doing. I don't look across the aisle or at somebody else. The, oh God, I thank you that I am not like other men is not acceptable for believers. It's an irrelevant point. God is the one who's dealing with everybody else's life. Many argue that pride was the first sin and is still at the root of all sin, and I could make a good case for that. Humility begins and ends with understanding that there is a God and that He alone is the sovereign God of the universe. And here's the kicker. He's God, I'm not. <laughs> I've got to get that first and foremost in my brain. He's God, I'm not. He's all wise, I'm not. He's all everything, I'm not. <laughs> His commands are not suggestions. His commands are given from a throne. And he expects everybody, every being, heaven, earth, under the earth, wherever it may be, to obey his commands. <laughs> that's not me, that's God. Isn't that what he says? Humility starts with understanding who he is. And if we don't get properly aligned there, the rest of our life is going to be messed up. You read of the ancients and what they would write, and, and, and they would add things to this understanding like, be able to rejoice no matter what the circumstances are in your life because God's providence is working out. So something comes my way that I don't particularly like and I can get all upset about it, but in the end I bow before the throne of the universe and say, this passed through your hand, God. <laughs> You're God, I'm not. You're sovereign, I'm not. You're God Almighty, I'm not. And I worship you. It's part of humility. Being able to receive from anyone, no matter who they are, wherever we put them in our pecking orders, this is what the old guys you know, in the ancients would write and say, you need to be able to see and receive God's truth from whoever the messenger is that's bringing it. Whatever your opinion of them, wow. However lowly or unimportant they may be. Or they'd throw this one in for good measure, as Paul would write, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Don't do anything except in counting others as better than you, more significant, more important. I've got to get my mind renewed. You want to start living a life that's worthy of the calling to which we have received? Click. It starts with getting rightly aligned with God. It starts with getting the right view of who I am compared to who He is. The, the mercy of God. The shame that has been dealt with at the cross and all those things we sang about today. And if we start to get that one right, then the next progression happens. He says, with gentleness. <laughs> you start dealing with one another. I'm an unworthy recipient of grace. And so is everybody else in my life. <laughs> I didn't deserve the forgiveness I've received and neither does anyone else. This word is translated as meekness, mildness, power with reserve, or perhaps better known, strength under control. You know, we've heard all these words. Jesus was gentle, yet he had the strength to call down angels, to create worlds, to do the things that he could do. 
Children would run and want to be in his lap, and we know children don't run to grumps and grouchy and angry people. <laughs> Jesus had this, this thing about him that was attractive, and it was the Spirit of God. Again, the old writers would say this word is summed up in the manner in which we receive injuries from others. Think about that one for a while. (laughs) Someone injures us, not physically necessarily, but emotionally. They wound us, they offend us, they hurt us. How do we respond to them? God help me. Am I gentle? Do I learn to deal in kindness and gentleness with other people? Beginning in the relationships that are closest to me. Oftentimes those are the ones that suffer the most. We put on our airs when we're out in public. We we pretend when we're out and we're nice. But what's it really like with the people that are the closest to us and know us the best? So start there (laughs) to be gentle. We're strong for people, not against people. We're strong in grace and giving love and grace towards others, not anger and judgment. This is tied up in this whole word of gentleness. We learn how to believe the best of one another. Instead of jumping to the worst. Living a life that is worthy is based in humility. (laughs) Getting our perspective right of who we are compared to God. And then learning how to walk in gentleness with one another. But it doesn't stop there. He says, with patience. Our favorite word. To just love patience. How do you get patience? How, How do you grow in patience? I want to be patient, and I want it right now. It doesn't work that way, does it? (laughs) We have to learn patience, and patience comes through God repeatedly giving us opportunities to grow. We, We learn how to be patient with one another. God has forgiven me an incalculable debt. How can I choke my brother or sister who owes me five bucks, comparatively speaking? And yet, don't I do that? (laughs) Maybe you do, maybe you don't. If we really get a glimpse of how much we've been forgiven, as Jesus said, how could we go and not forgive someone else, no matter what they've done? This word is often translated as long-suffering, How long is long suffering? (laughs) How long is long suffering? (laughs) Long. One of the definitions I liked here was no virtue perhaps is, or not, it's a quote, no virtue perhaps is more frequently demanded in our contact with others. We do not go far with any fellow traveler on the journey of life before we find there is great occasion for its exercise. (laughs) You don't have to be alive too long before you are given the opportunity to learn long-suffering and patience with someone else. Is that true? Yeah, of course it is. Another early church father defined long-suffering as the spirit that has the power to take revenge but never does. It is within my power to pay you back but I never will. Wow. Those of us who are getting a bit older, long in the tooth, as they say, can remember some of our early days where we were adamant about things that we were adamantly wrong about. (laughs) And as we have gotten older and matured, we get a different perspective of things. Life has a way of doing that to us doesn't mean everything we believe as, as a young person is wrong. But a lot of times things get tempered. A lot of times we learn to start walking more in grace to other people. We're zealots without wisdom sometimes when we're young. And it's not to downgrade the young. But God is not bound by our youthful wisdom and ignorance. God does what's needed to be done to get us to the place where He wants us to be. God's been patient with me. I must be patient with others. <laughs> Has God been patient with you? Did anybody come out of the womb perfect in here? 
Has anybody lived their life and never made a mistake, been out of the spirit, been upset, been angry? How do I learn to be patient with others? God gives me the opportunity. God makes sure that there are people in my life that cause me to go to him to ask for patience. Do you have people like that in your life? <laughs> Most of us do. That's how we learn patience. God gives us the opportunity. How many opportunities do you think God will give us to learn patience in our life? <laughs> More than one. The goal is to live a life worthy of the calling. And it starts with humility. It moves to being kind to other people, gentle with other people, which is involved and tied up with learning how to be patient with people. <laughs> learning how to be patient. Why, why, why? So we can bear with one another. Bearing with one another. What a phrase. It's defined as completing a process. Enduring putting up with, tolerating, to suffer alongside or because of someone. <laughs> to hold up without plots of revenge and offenses. Wow. Bear up, bearing with one another. I want to live a life worthy of the calling to which I've been received. Then learn how to hold up other people. <laughs> learn how to support them, bear with them. Put up with them. Endure them. Are you kidding me, Paul? I don't want to live that worthy. <laughs> Come on. And he says, no, it's got to start here. This is where it starts. This is how we do it. Wow. It's defined as completing a process. Because we understand our relationship with our Father, that He is mercy and grace and love. We can be gentle with others. We can learn to be patient with others. We can actually learn how to hold up one another in love and support and prayer, especially if they've hurt us, wounded us, or disappointed us. That's, what tied, that's what's tied up in here. You know, it's easy for me to hold up the people that are nice. Man, I'll support you. Man, I'm there for you. It's the ones that are a pain that it's a little more difficult, isn't it? It's so the ones that have hurt us. How long do I have to do this? Well, he adds that in love thing. How long do we have to walk in love one with another? <laughs> How long? Is there an end date to walking in love? You go to 1 Corinthians 13 and you read it and Paul says, this is a definition of love that you do for this long. Is that there? Is there a close date? Is there, is there an end date? But you don't understand this person. That's true. I probably don't, but God does. And God's word still tells us that we have to walk in love. <laughs> that we learn to walk in love. In fact, Paul says in verse 8 of 1 Corinthians 13 that love never ends. It never fails. In fact, he elevates it here at the end of it where he says, So now faith, hope, and love those are the big three. What's the greatest of these? <laughs> Faith and hope are awesome. And he says, yet love, it's the greatest. And how is love demonstrated again? <laughs> Where does love manifest itself? God, I love you. It's your people that I have a hard time with. You ever prayed that? Ever had that? <laughs> yeah, I cry too. Why are we doing these things? Why do we care? Well, verse 3, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, love. Why? Because we're eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. <laughs> eager to maintain the unity. Why? Why does unity matter? <laughs> Why does unity matter? You ever ask that question? What's the big deal about unity? Well, there's several things. I know this gets a little bit smaller, and most of us can quote this psalm probably, but behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. 
It's like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It's like the dew on Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. Why? For there the Lord has commanded his blessing, life forevermore. God, I want life. God says, I will give you life as you learn to walk in unity and love with your brothers. Can I get it some other way, God? Can't it be like just me and you somewhere alone? Yes, of course it can, my son. But the reality of what's happened in your heart will be demonstrated on how you walk in love with other people. You say, oh, God, come on. <laughs> Give me a break. Do you ever feel this way or am I just cynical? Is it just me? Some of you in here maybe are more natural-born lovers than I am. He says... This is how you get unity. <laughs> it's good and it's pleasant. Life is commanded there. Do we want life? It comes in unity. Why is it important? Well, here's a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. That's excellent. That really is good. By this, <laughs> what's the this there? What's the this? By this, there's a, there's a this there. Probably bad English, but what is it the this? <laughs> what is it? Isn't it learning how to love one another? Isn't that what it is? All people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. So I'm back to how do I live a worthy life? I got to learn how to love people. <laughs> come on some excellent goals he lays out here learn to walk in humility learn to become gentle become guided by patience supporting and bearing up others in God's love seeking the goal of unity in the spirit Lord I want to live a worthy life he says well here's how you start here's how you can walk this out here's how you can do this these are excellent goals to do. We can learn to get this straight. And if I get this right, and I understand that I'm not the all, end all, beat all, judge of everybody and everything, and I'm not the standard of all that's right and pure and good, God is, then I can learn to start walking with other people in a way that is kind and gentle and forbearing and long-suffering and in humility realizing that, man, I am a saved sinner by grace. <laughs> And so are they. I am a work in progress. And so are they. <laughs> I've got issues. And so do they. And I want people to bear with me and my issues. And they want the same thing. You see how this works out? This is tied together. How we love one another. How we walk with one another. Walk in a manner worthy to the calling. How do we get there? How do we start? How do we move on that line? How do we have that as a good goal? This is an excellent goal, by the way, to live a life worthy. It is walked out this way, <laughs> beginning in our own homes, beginning with the people that know us, beginning with those that are in our life that we bump into all the time. It's a picture of a glorious, wonderful life from God's point of view. Now, we understand, I hope you understand, that this is a process. <laughs> no one is there yet. No one is doing all of these things perfectly. At least I've never met them. But let's not grow weary in well-doing. Let's not give up on the process. Let's keep going. Let's keep striving for unity. Let's keep laying down the things that bother us to bear with one another. I'm not just talking in this group. I'm talking about the people in our lives. Man, it's tough sometimes. There are people that are just flat out difficult. And as far as it depends on you, sometimes you can't. I understand that. But it doesn't discredit what we're supposed to strive for and seek after. We keep on walking. If we've given up, if we've become cynical, if we are full of anger and bitterness and hatred towards other people, we need to repent and humble ourselves before God 
And go back and read Matthew 18, the end of it. We all get hung up on confronting one another in Matthew 18. The end of Matthew 18 deals with the unrighteous servant choking somebody because they didn't understand how much they were forgiven. It starts there. God help me. We all can grow. We can all follow the Lord. So let me just pull it home here before we quit. We all have an individual walk with God. How are we doing? From the youngest to the oldest in here, if you name the name of Christ, how is it going in your walk? Honestly. Some of you probably say, yeah, pretty good. Some say, mm, maybe not so good. Oh, all right, I struggle here, I struggle there. But overall, it's okay. You know, it stinks. And it's probably everything in between. Wouldn't it be? The group of people? And maybe it's the day of the week. I said, my life is anything but a straight line. I get dizzy sometimes. From, you know, internally how it is. But what's our goal? What are we after? I want to live a life that is worthy and brings glory to God. Don't you? So how are we doing <laughs> regarding humility? I'm so humble it stinks. I'm great. Just lost my humble badge. But how are we doing? And I'm not talking about some false humility. I'm talking about being rightly connected to God and understanding who he is and what he is, and how we walk that out with everybody else. Do I really think I'm better than everybody else? Or, you know, maybe not everybody else, but at least those people. I'm a lot better than they are. Really? Come on, let's get real. How am I doing in being kind and gentle to people? How am I doing with that? How about your spouse and your siblings? <laughs> your boss? People you hang out with? How are we doing in those areas? about patience all preachers know you can get people uncomfortable if you talk about patience and the tongue why is that well because we all struggle with those things how are we doing with being for people that bearing up isn't just means enduring what it also means is we support we are for people man i am for you in here I know sometimes I can come across harsh or direct or rude or whatever, but I'm for you. I want you to be successful in your walk with God. More than anything else, that's what I want. <laughs> Shouldn't we have that attitude one to another? Yes. I'm for you. <laughs> I want you to succeed. That's what bearing up means. I will do what's necessary to help you any way I can and support you, and love you, and pray for you, and give you grace when you mess up, and overlook dumb things that go on, and so forth. God, help us to mature to these places. Why? Well, because unity is where life is. Do I really value unity? And I'm not talking about let's compromise over sin stuff that goes on out there where people get together with everybody under the sun in the name of unity. That's ridiculous. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about within the body of Christ. Will we walk in unity one with another? Do we value it? Do we want life? Because he said, that's where I'll command the blessing. The Lord said, when brothers walk in unity. That's true in a family. It's true in a church. It's true in our relationships. Let's rally about what we can unify on and walk. And God says, I'll bless that. I will give my blessing to that. And again, I'm not talking sin. My last question you personally it's easy to look around and say I mean, there's some areas that guy needs to work on <laughs> i'm going to get this tape for them they really need it tape see i'm dating myself i'm going to get this mp3 for them is that better <laughs> they need to hear this well maybe but what about me are there things in my life that the lord is trying to deal with you know, you really can't listen for other people. You can listen for yourself. Most of the time I'm talking to me. Are there things that need to change in my life? Yes. Am I willing to bow before the throne of God and say, God, please, do what needs to be done to bring me to a place of change? That's where the rubber meets the road. Will you pray that today? <laughs> 
God, will you please do what needs to be done? Scary prayer. God loves us so much, he'll do it. So here's how I'm praying in addition to that. God, I'm so grateful for your love and your grace and your mercy that flows, that is so hard for us to comprehend. Would you use words like lavished and abundance, things that I can't even get my mind around when I think of your love and your grace. And Lord, I enjoy swimming in it. I pray that I would be able to give it to others. Just what I've been given. (laughs) So much. Thank you for it, God. God, I'm thankful that your word is so very clear. You have told us. This is how you can walk in a manner worthy of what we have been given. Lord, would you please help us? Each one of us. I know we tune in and out during a message and things that apply and don't necessarily apply, but... God, would you please take the things that are from you and let them go deep into our hearts where you want to change us. You want us to be more like you. And I thank you that your word is clear and it's living and it's sharp and it's active and it's powerful. God, would you please let it do its work in my heart, in my life, for people listening today. And God, I thank you that as long as we're alive, we have an opportunity to grow and to change and to walk on with you. Lord, this is the day you have made. We have an opportunity. I pray we would not waste it. God, help us. Thank you that you love us so very, very much. We were back praying in the room this morning before the service and I had this little thing in my mind little mini somebody was praying about God's love and grace and I just saw this picture of sitting in like a rowboat in the ocean and that sometimes I feel like I use up God's love and God's grace and it was like the Lord saying you know take, take a, a, a thimble out of the ocean And that's enough love for your entire life, Click. And then I heard the thunder and the rain, and and I think of how much rain there is. And that a little thimbleful out of the ocean is, is, you can't even measure how little it is. And God has so much more than that. I've not used up the love of God. I've not used up the grace of God in either of you. God, have your way today. Amen.